Okay. Welcome everyone to the Sustainability August Challenge uh, for the New York Guild of Hand Weavers. Uh, this was a challenge that was inspired by the Philadelphia Guild, and we take uh, great pleasure in um, doing something that they had suggested to do. Uh, it's about trying to understand our environment and understand um, how we can better utilize our resources and techniques so that we uh, are aware of, of our environment and our ecological and um, cognizant of, of what we're doing. So we're going to get started. And the first person to talk is going to be Kate, who was one of the founders of the Philadelphia's Challenge on Sustainability. So Kate, please take it away. All right, good morning. Uh, my inspiration for this piece was the canceled stamp of Edna Vincent Millay. I love the colors, I love the cancellation mark. So that's what I started with. And I mounted it on a used tea bag. And what I did was I added rust to the tea water and I got that nice dark look. Then that was mounted on a snippet, a leftover piece of weaving when I cut off the ends of things. And then that is mounted on a scrap piece of paper. Now, what I did with the scrap piece of paper, I took Edna St. Vincent's poems and some of her poems are very depressing. So I searched and I found inspiring poems and um, I, had, I just typed straight across the paper. And, um, oh, I typed with a 1960s refurbished Remington typewriter. So that was safe from going into a dumpster or pile of junk. So I just kept typing over each one um, just returned, if I returned in the middle of a word, I just wrote the word on the next line. Then I took the paper and I painted it with light tea water and darker tea water and then some of the rust water. And then what I did was I needed to mount it so I got pizza box tops and I cut them out and I used scraps of Devoray, which came from a research center of donated scraps. And that is the wrong side of the Devoray. That's why you don't see all the, the um, designs in it. I thought the designs took away from the piece. Then I needed to mount that. So I trash picked a canvas that had abstract painting on it and I painted that white and um, a little bit of tea colored mixed in with the white. And that is my piece. The actual piece is eight by 10 and mounted it's 12 by 12. And everything is sustainable. <laughs> and that's it. And how many of these uh canceled stamp uh, tapestries have you done or artwork? Pardon? How many of these ta these canceled stamp artworks have you done so far? Because this is one of many. Yeah, I think I've done a total of about 10 or 11. It's been a lot of fun. And I put them all on weavings and I never knew what to mount them on. And my cat dragged out one of my snippets that had been on the floor and it was all chewed and I, it was the right color. So that went under my first stamp and started the whole thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, Gigi. Hello, everybody. Um, I am a rigid heddle weaver. Um, I'm sort of learning multi shaft, but I'm very comfortable on my rigid heddle. Um, I was inspired by fellow guild member 
Lynn, who grew indigo on her Brooklyn balcony and on one movie night generously offered seeds. I put my hand up, as did Kate. They've grown like crazy up on my roof. If anyone's growing Japanese indigo, I'll just say that you need to keep them quite moist. They like water. And I'm going to be getting three harvests from the plant. Um, so I did a fresh leaf indigo dye. So basically, since March, these plants have been taking carbon dioxide out of the air and putting oxygen into the air. Then I did a harvest of the leaves, which look like basil leaves, whereas the stems are the same as buckwheat and Japanese knotweed, same family, that green stem with a reddish things on it. You take these leaves that look like basil leaves, you put them in the blender, not the one that you use food for, <laughs> and you just whiz them with, with some ice water. You have to, they say fresh indigo, they mean it, like pick the leaves and put them in a bowl of ice water and then whiz them with a small bit of ice water. And then just strain that liquid into a tub and throw in what you want. Um, I threw in a mixture of silk fabric that where you see there that um, sort of bluish color. I threw in some wool, which you see there as the blue wool. And I also threw in half silk, half wool, wool, half sheep wool. I'm a spinner really. Um, and what I found is that silk can get right down to a deep teal blue or all the way up through aqua, depending on how long you leave it in. Wool, even though I left it in for about four hours, I, I just got this sort of verdigris to aqua color. And then I cut the silk remnant into strips and I had this ball of pinkish white leftover hand spun that's made with tensel and soy and I think a bit of wool. It's like an old ball just rolling around my floor. And then I rigid heddled this, a strip of the silk with the ends hanging out and then a strip of the pink hand spun, or rather a snippet, strip of the silk, four strands of that single ply curly whirly hand spun. And I just repeat, silk, white hand spun, silk, curly whirly hand spun. And so it's a chindi style, which is the Indian rag weaving, um, or you could say sakiori with the Japanese rag weaving. And um, yeah, so I just made this little thing to, um, set my candle on because a lot of my living room is now turning into go. <laughs> so thank you, Lynn. <laughs> so this kind of fresh leaf dye technique is different from having one of those indigo pots. Yeah. So the indigo pot is basically where you're fermenting the indigo leaves. Um, you could think like sourdough bread, sourdough starter. And that's a process that takes a number of days and you get that very deep indigo blue like you see with blue jeans. Um, although blue jeans nowadays, it's actually artificially made indigo. They don't use the plants anymore. So that's not very sustainable. Um, with the fresh leaf, which John Marshall, who many of you probably know from MAFA conferences and other things, he champions that one. And fresh leaf is where once you pick the leaf, it starts to lose its ability to die progressively. So you either have to work with it right away or you can put it in a sealed bag in the fridge with some cold water and just keep it cold. <laughs> um, you know when the leaves are ready to be used for fresh indigo dyeing because when you pick a leaf and you leave it to dry for a couple of hours, it will turn this deep indigo dried out leaf looking and then you know it's got enough pigment in it. Okay, next is Katie. Please unmute Hi. yourself. Okay. Um, so this is, um, first I have to ask Gail, did you give me uh, the, at a meeting, I'm trying to find. Yes, it, it, it was me. <laughs> I, okay. I, I fished all of that out of the, the city trash basket. And it was like a big fat coil like that. And I split them all up and wound up all the individuals because I watch a lot of television. I'm, I'm well, so excited about what you did with it. This is really helpful to have. Um, 
so I will bring this to the September meeting because it's great material. I also will show um, that I reinforced my computer wire. I can't see myself, so I don't know if I'm, uh, let's see, standard. No, I'm, um, I'm, sh I'm sharing the screen so you, we can't see oh, you. Okay, that's all right. So this, well, I'll show uh, when it, I can, I'll show you how I reinforce my computer power wire. So um, I love this. It was made with the material that Gail uh, brought and the technique was from Sally. I saw you here, so I'm glad you're here because you might be able to talk more about this <laughs> technique. It was woven on the loom in a way that uh, Sally had done a hat. So it was, um, the warp, the weft is only brought over. It's the weft is done like in a kind of a diagonal, kind of triangles. And so then it comes off the loom and then it's drawn together. Uh, when it shows after the screen share stops, I'll show you how I adhered the bottom. Um, but the, the wire is really fun to work with and there's a lot of it left. So um, I'm happy to share the wire and see what other people do with it too. And that I use it uh, right next to my loom. I put scissors and little other tools, tape measure and that type of thing. So um, great. So hope to see uh, you at the September meeting and grab some of the, the leftover wire. <laughs> the wire is the weft and the warp was a 5-2 cotton and um, that I had left over. So uh, yeah, thanks for the feedback. Anybody have any questions? If Carol, if you could show, um, is it too hard to stop the screen share? Or no, I'll stop it? the screen okay. share and hold on one minute. Let me just spotlight you for everyone. Oh, okay. So here's the leftover. Uh, bag of it. it didn't take that much and here's what I've done is I reinforced my computer power cord oh, um, so that uh, didn't seem like I need to buy a whole new cord when they were only a couple pieces frame so that and then um, the bottom got drawn in I don't know how sustainable this but I use duct tape <laughs> so to seam it <laughs> And, on, and, and keep it stable on the bottom so I can put scissors in there. But um, yeah, I love this little piece. And look, at it, it was easy to make it, Gail, because you had separated all the colors. So, so yeah, thanks. Katie, was it hard to work with wire? Not really. Uh, you can sure get a good edge from it because you can, um, you know, it's so controlled. Right. Yeah, I really liked it. It's fantastic. And it'll last okay. forever. Yeah. So I call it my landline basket. <laughs> Katie, was it hard to beat the the wires closer? Um, not really, because the 5-2 cotton um, was kind of, uh, no, it, it didn't, I don't have that remembering that it was tough to do that. Uh, well, I might have been concerned that it was um, a little tough on the reed, but it ended up not being tough on the reed. It's pretty thin wire, right? Yes, yes. I'll get out a little coil of it. And so. That's great. Yeah. So thanks, Gail. Thanks all for the feedback. Okay, let me share again. Okay, uh, next, Carol Cover, is she here? Okay, let me just. Okay, I unmuted. Ah. Um, so, in the height of COVID, when there was nothing to do but go to the supermarket and otherwise stay home, I kind of went through my drawers 
and realize I had a lot of its fabric from various workshops. And that kind of hit simultaneously where I was thinking of getting a new quilt. Um, the quilt I'm talking about is 14 years old and I tend to use it as a desk sometimes. So it had a couple of ink stains. And these two things kind of merged together and I decided to make a cover for the quilt. So it has been an ongoing process because I'm sewing it by hand. The um, center part is shibori. It's a combination of things I've done at the workshops, um, store-bought fabric, and old clothes. Uh, there are a couple of pairs of jeans represented, as well as some blouses that I no longer uh, are wearing. So um, at this point, um, I have the two side long edges to do uh, on the bottom, and that is the end of side one. And uh, I have enough fabric to do side two. Hello? Yeah, it looks great. It's gorgeous. So did you do the shibori in a class? It was in the workshop. Mm -hmm. The shibori is beautiful. How big is the shibori, is the piece of shibori? Um, actually, the centerpiece was pretty much whole, as is. The side pieces were maybe about 50 inches long and about 10 inches deep. And I just cut it up into strips as I needed it or wanted it. I did want to vary the sizes for the quilt. So some fabric is five inches deep, some is two inches deep. You know, that, that was kind of design decisions at the moment. Wonderful reuse of fabric. Excuse me? I said it's a wonderful reuse of fabric. I like it a lot. Me, me, me too. <laughs> Good. That was important to be pleased. All right, next is Lynn. Is Lynn here? Lynn was going to join us from Vancouver. Maybe we'll come back and get her if she joins. Okay, next is Gail. Hi everyone. Um, my, uh, my sustainability is um, some knitted uh, dog toys. Um, my friends in Central Park with their dogs, we sort of make a big deal out of their birthdays. So um, yeah, everybody gets a handmade toy uh, from me. So um, uh, Murray is my neighbor and he got a slice of pizza and it has a rattle in it. And uh, the designer that I work for, Ralph Rucci, has um, his bulldog loves bananas. So I made him a banana and the peel comes off um, in, in one piece. So I've made everything out of scrap yarns, but the, the real sustainability is the, um, the stuffing, which uh, I don't know if anybody remembers that when you used to fly, you would get a little pillow from the airline and I would take mine with me. And I've also rescued some pillows from the trash bin in my building and take out the stuffing and, and put it in a pillowcase and um, throw it in the washer. And so that's the true sustainable um, portion, I think, of, of uh, 
of my little projects. But um, but the owners are always really thrilled with them, and so are the dogs. And right now, I'm making um, a crocheted uh, miniature Jeff Coons dog. That if you're familiar with the um, the twisted balloon sculptures um, of of dogs. Jeff Koons is an artist that makes them giant size, but I'm making a little one for, for another doggy friend. Very fun. Thank you. Amazing. Okay, next is Catherine Barrios. Oh, can everyone hear me? I just unmuted this. Yes, we can. Okay, well, uh, my inspiration for this uh, came out of, I do a kind of a daily um, medication uh, meditation in the morning. And one, a couple months ago, the leader was talking about kintsugi, which comes from a Japanese tradition of mending pottery. So in, in Kintsuki, what the, the theory or the, the idea behind Kintsuki is that you embrace the flaws and the imperfection and you create a stronger and more beautiful piece of art. And so what they do in the Kintsuki, which is pottery mending, is they would first mend a piece and then they would cover it with a design in gold. So I had this knit skirt, which the moss had gotten into, and it was in such bad shape, there was no way that it could be mended. It couldn't even be donated because it was just, it had too many holes. So I had been thinking about, I didn't want to put it into a landfill. So I had been thinking about what I could possibly do with this thing. And so it occurred to me that I could embroider, I could turn it into a shrug and embroider over all of the moth holes. And that way I would have something, you know, usable, wearable out of this, uh, this unsalvageable skirt. So um, it, this sent me on kind of a little voyage because I hadn't used my sewing machine in years. I had, I thought I was going to need to use a serger, which I also hadn't used. So I went looking for red thread. I was sure I had some, but you know, serger, you need to have a lot of different cones. So I'm going through cupboards and pulling things out. I'm unearthing my sewing machine. I actually had to reread the instructional manual because I hadn't, I hadn't used it in so long. I couldn't remember how to do it. So anyway, I got, I managed to get the thing sewn together. The hem was in pretty good shape. So if you look at the close up uh, picture, the end of the sleeves is actually the hem of the skirt. And it turned out I had an overlock stitch on my machine. So I didn't have to use the serger, which was a good thing because I didn't find the instructional serger book and that would have, you know, taken more time. So I got the whole thing sewed. I didn't like the length of the sleeve. It was sort of the, um, this hem in the back is where I sewed, where I cut the waistband off of the skirt and I sewed the two pieces together. So um, that formed the back seam. So the length was predetermined by the length of the skirt and it was kind of a short skirt. So I decided I wanted to lengthen uh, the skirt. So I looked in, a, I have a crochet book of borders. So I looked for, I was looking through my yarn stash, trying to find, you know, yarns that would go with the red, looking through embroidery thread stashes for gold threads that I could use for the flowers. So I, you know, I got every, I got it, I got all the sewing done. I did all of the crochet work that went pretty, pretty well. And then I went to embroider these flowers. But what I found out was the fabric because of the moth holes wasn't stable enough for the embroidery. So I actually had to go in with red thread and darn every single one of those bloody holes before I could even embroider it. So I, I got all of that done. So the flowers were essentially placed 
where there were holes. So when I, when I put the thing on, I tried it on, there was this big kind of blank space in the middle back I didn't like. So I ended up putting in four additional flowers to kind of balance out most of the ones that you see in the kind of the center bank uh, uh, back were not covering moth holes, but all the rest of them were, you know, covering up my, uh, my little moth holes. So this is, this was the piece. And it was a really an odyssey to put it together. But um, my husband, he, he really liked it. I was going to try to sell it on Etsy and he said I should keep it. So I guess I'll see it'll be it'll be a bright piece for Christmas holidays. So that that was it. So. Oh, and I found a label. You can't see really see it here, but I found a label in my stash that says um, this took forever. <laughs> so it literally took me about two weeks to do the project. And I sold, I sold, I sold the label into the back of the shrug. So anyway, <laughs> so that's, uh, that was my odyssey about this. Wonderful recycling and upcycling. Yes. Okay, thank you, Kate. Catherine. Next is Donna. Donna, you need to unmute. Sorry. Um, yeah, so 3D is my jam. I wrote that because that's really kind of the direction I've been trying to head for a while. I mean, I've done some jewelry, so that's kind of in that ballpark. But um, I was introduced to Vanina Buchalter by uh, uh, Susan Weltman. Uh, who knew her from uh, um, uh, Weave a Real Piece. And uh, she was doing this workshop. I couldn't take it because it was during convergence. And she, she put on another workshop at the end. Um, so this is the result of that, uh, the sample that we did. We did a wing, which you see on the bottom and on the top is a pyramid. All of everything in this came from either dead weaver sale, uh, things I knitted, the leftover scraps from that, um, something that somebody donated to me uh, to do some charity we uh, knitting for, and I used a little bit of that, and also used it for charity knitting. <laughs> and um, the warp uh, also was uh, a gift from a, of a bunch of rug wool and stuff. So I, and I was scrambling to find things that would, look halfway decent together and um, and be the right weight for this project. Um, so uh, this is the result. It was really fun. Tons of thoughts about using wire with this and doing some other things. And she did a second part, which I also used scraps for. And um, the scraps left over from cutting things are, are what are, are stuffing the pyramid. So I used a lot, I used the scraps as well from the, from the piece. And it was just fantastic. And she's a wonderful teacher. And, and I do have some ideas for, I've been collecting things for years to do a piece about um, commercial retail fashion, um, but that's, I'm still working on my thoughts for design, so. The next sustainability challenge. Maybe I'll have that together. Anyway, Donna, Donna, could you explain the three D weaving? Is that done while you're weaving the rest of it, or is it done yeah. afterwards? It's done. It's all done together. Um, it's uh, not to give too much away because I think everybody should take her class. Um, but you do. Um, you have more than one warp. So that's how it's done. Yeah, uh, she's uh, she, Vanina has a an Instagram and a, a Facebook, I think. And anybody who's interested, I can put her contact information in the not Facebook. She has an email and a web. Yeah. Anyway, I can put her contact information in the chat if you want. And she does. Can, these I, can I say something? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um... She, um, I, I, I wanted to take her class too, but I, I wasn't able to. And I think she's giving quite a few classes, but I think she also just joined the guild. Yes, she did. She did join the guild. That's correct. Great. Okay. Yeah. 
she's really lovely and yeah, and a good teacher. Terrific. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she's in Buenos Aires, if you guys didn't catch that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fanny, our latest member spotlight person. <laughs> Um, this was a, a fun project. Um, I even before uh, the sustainability uh, challenge was announced, I had been collecting plastic, um, thinking that it might be a good fiber to do something with at some point. And so when this challenge came up, I just uh, pulled all my plastics together and I, I found that a lot of the plastics had the same colors as this plastic rice bag that I had. So basically I set up a warp and uh, cut the rice bag into strips and just wove it back together. Um, part, of, part of my thoughts were that many years ago growing up, it, you, you know, when you're Asian, you buy 25 pound bags of rice you know, you don't buy a five pound bag, it's gone in a week. So when I was growing up as a child, the, the bags of rice were always like burlap bags or, or um, uh, some other material. It, it wasn't plastic, but the world is has gone to plastic for most things in life. Um, so for that for that reason, cutting up this bag and reweaving it together was um, cut part of a personal statement. But it is also a comment not only of uh, everything turning uh, in the world using so much plastic. It's a, a comment on on empty rice bags that uh, there that there are so many people in the world who do not have enough to eat or who struggle to have enough to eat. So um, it's just my way of making a comment like that. So it's pretty straightforward. I, I, wove, um, I wove it uh, with a very narrow warp. It's only about five inches wide. And uh, the pieces hanging from the bottom are the plastic pieces that uh, hold lemons and oranges and clementines. Um, and I, I just cut them and let them drape. So it was a it was a fun project to do and to think about, but I I was also thinking about the very seriousness of it. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Next is Charlene. Uh, this is really a double sustainability project because the fabric that began this process was originally slated for a regular rag rug. I used to make a lot of them, but I don't and haven't for years, and we can't have them on the floor anymore because they're trip hazards. Uh, I have given, I used to take and make two to three inch strips and then roll them in like a pinwheel. Uh, so that I could use them. And I have given them to historic <laughs> uh, weaving centers and that to use. And I had a couple left because I always was going to do something else. Um, as some of you know, I have a shaft switching device on my rug loom, but that is not going to accommodate fabric. And this was really kind of a challenge too, to see how fabric was going to work on this, with the shaft switching device. I halved in length these long strips that had been sewn together and old cotton, lots, it, I think there was more polyester than I normally would like, but it, they were old discarded sheets. This is, you know, nothing, nothing purchased. I halved them. So I ended up with one and a quarter, one and a half inch strips. Half of them I dyed with, a, I found a leftover packet of, Cushing dye in purple. And that was kind of the color I wanted anyway. And uh, I had the warp in a stash. I, in fact, I was gonna give it away. Um, and I used that four ends per inch 
I had grouped my threads because it was just regular cotton Maysville carpet work. Um, the weave, I just did it to the grid, just it's a three end two tie unit weave, meaning summer and winter, which is what a shaft switching device weaves. Um, and I have a three quarter inch shaft switching device, which I'm sure Katie's is half inch, which gives you much higher definition than I can achieve. But you'll see in the um, background, the sheet was a creamy color and it had flowers on it. So, you know, Mr. Ram is out eating his greens or whatever. And of course, if you turn it over, it's everything is reversed. My real change of plan came for the finishing because when I do rugs, I do a half Damascus and then I hide all those ends. That wasn't going to be possible with something that the fabric weft did not co totally cover the warp. So I had to rethink it and it's, it's small. It's kind of like bath mat size. I didn't want any knots because that would hurt your feet. So I ended up encasing um, casing the hemp on a, on a shaft switching device. You really only have three threads. So you cannot weave a plain weave unless you do it by hand, which is what I did. So I got a plain weave, um, salvages on both ends and then simply enclose them. Wow. Very clever. Thank you. Charlene, it's Gigi. I just want to say he should be the mascot of your daughter's um, sheep farm. That's <laughs> farm. <laughs> that hang out That's there. a good point, except her sheep don't have horns. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> no, <laughs> Cooper don't have horns like that. But I just thought it made him interesting to have horns. Thanks, Gigi. <laughs> he was fun. He actually, it actually was fun to do. Um, and I did have enough warp that I put another one on just because it was fun. And I was trying to sort out how much fabric would it take to pretty much cover the warp. So new challenges So and fun too. So thank you for the challenge. Okay, next is Evelyn with another animal. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, Yes, this is a piece that I did with uh, leftover yarn. I can see in the bottom, there's a photo of it. And my big friend here was the Mod Podge. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is actually on an eight by 10 canvas. And I sketched the scene out first. Um, I was doing this kind of like I got an inspiration to do elephant. And um, I had the sketch done, but when Carol introduced us to the sustainability project, for some reason, I just didn't paint this. I, it wasn't drawing me to paint the, this we particular painting. Uh, so I thought about the sustainability and I watched a documentary. I, I don't remember the name because it's been a long time since I've seen it. And there was a, docu a documentary done in PBS a while back about the landfills being filled instead of garbage, you know, we're, we're doing so much to recycle the garbage, it's now being filled with yarn and clothes and fabric and, and all these textiles that are being thrown out um, in, in, in the garbage. And so um, they were showing the effects that that had in the environment. And so, um, in trying to figure out what to do with my sustainability project, I went to my yarn. That was like the inspiration. I went to this, uh, I have a, when I, I weave, I crochet and I knit, and I always throw in that leftover yarn that you kind of like want to use later on. So I have a little bag of it and um, I decided to use the piece, the, those, those strips of yarn into my painting. And I just, the top part of it is regular acrylic paint on the sky, but everything else is the yarn that I use. So I took an old brush <laughs> uh, 
and meticulously uh, formed the mountains with that yarn there, uh, which was uh, the brownish color and tan. The grass area, I just, you know, glued everything on and it took time for me to do it. It took me about a month to get it all ready. And um, typically, and everything else was where the grasses, the green and the brown background of the bushes and down in the uh, bottom of the, um, the sandy area, that is, um, I just cut up little strips of fuzzy yarn that I had and I meticulously put them in and glued everything on to, to have a lot of texture as if it was bushy and kind of, you know, um, when you touch the painting, you can really feel it. And then the elephant, I just formed, you know, the yarn around it and pushed everything in with the glue and just continued to work on the elephant shape. Uh, and at first, most elephants are kind of like that grayish tone. I, I didn't like the way that that looked against the background. So I changed it to pink. <laughs> and it's my, I guess, unique way of putting the little pink area in the in the elephant and making it unique to pop out. And I call it peaceful elephant. And um, I guess that was my way of kind of saving the landfills for a little bit. And it has inspired me to do other painting projects, larger ones in this form. Um, so that's basically it. <laughs> I had a lot of fun doing it. It was great. Oh, and I just wanted to add after uh, I did the gluing and everything, I let everything dry and then I sort of put a Mod Podge over it to preserve the yarn and keep it all shiny so nothing can be displaced. By the way, the, uh, the, the shiny red uh, overlay on the elephant, those are like little rhinestones that I had in a pack of, of craft things that I save. Um, so I guess my recycling of all these materials is part of the sustainability challenge. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, I'm next, okay. <laughs> so um, as some of you know, I have a studio in Gowanus and I'm surrounded by coffee roasters and I, I smell it every day on my way there and home. So coffee always is on my mind. And I kept seeing all of these wonderful big bags for the coffee beans. Some of them were in burlap, but some of them were in these, this, this plastic fiber that they made to look like burlap was actually plastic. But I started looking at the names and there was, you know, places where it was from, Colombia, Ethiopia, Brazil, I mean, all over the world. And I was thinking, wow, there, we spent an awful lot of, of time and effort and uh, diesel fuel and, you know, all sorts of, of energy to get our coffee beans for our addiction to the U.S. from all over the world. Um, so between that and using these sort of uh, foil plastic vacuum bags that hold the beans for what I buy I was into a, a whole went down a rabbit hole on coffee so I took the vacuum plastic bags and I actually cut them into strips and then made sort of stylized coffee beans and used filters for the for the seam and then made a, a mobile for it so it's um it's probably about four feet long because the coffee bags are, the sacks are really large. Uh, but I love the toucan. I thought that was really a very nice picture on the, one of the coffee sacks. Um, Carol? Yes. I, I love that you made a mobile because I, I think that that's uh, sort of like a, an undiscovered art form. Um, the, the only artist I can think of that made them was, was uh, Calder, Alexander Calder. So um, kudos for, for, the, uh, for the mobile. <laughs> it was really tough to photograph because I hung it up and then it kept moving. So 
was a it was a challenge. But yes, uh, mobiles are fun, and you know I would encourage anybody who's going to do something to maybe think about other ways of displaying it besides flat. Uh, next is Sally. Okay, I did not anticipate that Smart Wool would start a sock recycling program, which they just started in the last couple months. So you do not have to take your fun Smart Wool socks and turn them into pot um, handle holders because you can now take them to. Um, I, I saw actually a distribution box at a at a um, you know kind of an outdoor store uh, last month, but. Um, I had these like favorite smart wool socks and they kind of wore out at the heel and the toe. So I, I had seen, I think it was at a world market store. They had these pot, these um, pot, the, the handle holders that were made to look like dogs and cats and different kinds of animals. And I thought that was kind of fun. So I, it took a lot of like somebody else said where you had to like dust off your sewing machine and um, use skills that you haven't used in a while. <laughs> um, it was, it was kind of all of that um so um but it took one sock to make like one <laughs> little pan holder so that's all <laughs> great so Sally, what I have are they a, stuffed with um i think i used um i i had been work also working on pot holders for the guild sale so i probably used um I tend to have like, I try and use that 100% cotton quilt batting that I just had, you know, that's not too thick um, in my stash. And basically everything I had in the stash. So there wasn't going to the store for anything. Um, and they're not super, super thick. Uh, but again, you know, wool, smart wool probably is a blend. Um, it's wool and I don't know if there's some poly in there or not because of the stretch. So I'm thinking, you know, with, you don't want to get that too close to flames, basically, is the other kind of thought I had after I had repurposed that. Um, but not too thick. Um, by the time you do the layer, the lining and the, um, because the, because it has to be, you know, it's like you're, you're, you're sewing two complete sides and then putting them together and then turning it inside out because the handle has to go all the way through to the back. And the reason why I said knee highs would be better is because this little guy was probably like six inches or something. And I realized when you hold a pot and it's full of water or spaghetti or whatever, you hold it closer to the pot instead of at the edge of the handle. So, so this, kind of, this kind of thing is good if you're kind of flicking the handle out of the way or whatever, but if you're really gonna pick up the pot, you want kind of a longer pot holder or at least for that handle holder, at least for that size pot and a cow, and a cow flan, which is pretty heavy. Okay, you have a few more. Oh yeah, so um, I watched the sustainability challenge that the Philly Guild, and I was really inspired because I know somebody, um, um, her name is Betty Gonter, and she's a basket maker, recycle. She's come, come over to my lake community to gather cattails, uh, phragmites. Uh, she has all kinds of stuff, dandelions. She's come to collect dandelion stems to make cordage. So I was noticing that the um, plastics, and I had actually said this at the, at the Philadelphia Guild, I held up this piece of plastic and I'm like, I wanna do something with this colorful plastic containers that tomatoes come in, because they come in, the cherry tomatoes, they come in purple, they come in yellow, they come in orange and red, and they have different shapes. This was the oval, There's, the yellow is circular. And um, I, so I went to my friend Betty's house and asked her, she has a whole garage full of stuff that's drying. And so these were um, native uh, grasses from our part of Northern New Jersey. And she's a really, really good basket maker. And so she helped me to make this um, basket. And I actually went over to her house um, in the last couple of weeks because I wanted to have another one to show you. Because when I made this one, um, I thought it'd be really cool to make like a birdhouse and flip it upside down. Now, if you're a really good basket maker, you make a basket with sides that are going parallel but I am not a very good basket maker. So they kind of creep crept in like that. And I thought if I continue to do that and I do it upside down, it would make kind of a, if you can imagine a teepee shape upside down with a little hole for the bird to go in. And the second part is um, I started working with um, a different uh, spokes, which are the parts that you weave. The weavers go in and out. The spokes are what we call the warp. Um, 
when you're on a limb. And um, so when I did it upside down, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't gonna break away. The, the lid wouldn't break away from the rest of the basket. So I was trying to use some, some twine and some other materials that weren't quite strong enough. So that basket is still in, or that birdhouse is still in progress. But I was thinking that the wire that Katie had, that would be one use for that, would be to, um, to strengthen the spokes with wire and then whatever grasses that you use for the spokes. Um, so, and that might make it kind of fun with the different colors too. So um, basket one uh, is done and birdhouse project two is still um, underway. So maybe the next challenge, I'll have that one done. Great. And then your last one. Oh, yeah. So I had, I, I'd never talked about the water, water bottle holder, but I may have shared the, um, the cushions that I made. I made four cushions for our patio. This was sort of the beginning of the COVID um, thing. So the, um, I hand spun a ton of newspaper sleeves and they were in a couple different colors, but predominantly blue and, and red. And I probably saved those for a couple of years, like, you know, just had like a pile in the garage. And um, the thing was when I started to weave, I had at Home Depot, I had found um, bailing twine that was in um, six really fun colors of plastic. And they were really cheap, like, I don't know, 90, less than a buck for a ball. And so I ended up, um, I was hoping to use the spun, the hand spun um, bags for the warp, but I found that they weren't strong enough that they kept breaking. So in the few places where I had initially started to use them as accent colors, I had to replace them with the bailing twine. So, um, so it's kind of like a 50-50 kind of project. Um, I also realized I didn't have enough bags of the sleeves so again, one of my friends gave me a couple of plastic tablecloths that had been used at like birthday parties, get like at the dollar store. So I treated them just like the plastic bags and I spun everything on a, on a spindle because I don't have a wheel. And it's not a good idea because I practically gave myself tennis elbow <laughs> from it. But with the remaining cloth that was left on the loom, I made this water bottle holder. And I've been using that water bottle holder for a couple of years now. And it's, a, it's held up amazing. Um, and the fishing line, when you use the fishing line as your weft, clear fishing line and whatever um, thickness, I guess you could say that you want, because I tested a couple of different uh, gauges, um, but it makes, it, it was re it's really sturdy. It makes a great um, fabric, a, a, an all purpose, very usable fabric. So that's it. If anyone has any questions, um, ask away. <laughs> Unmute yourself. When are you going to get your first spinning wheel, Sally? Yeah, actually, <laughs> I've I've gone over to um, I've gone over to somebody who lives in my area, and we've had two spinning lessons. So I actually have um, wool on a, on an on an actual spinning wheel bobbin, and it went better than I thought. I wasn't quite four thumbs like I expected. These are wonderful. These are really fun too. Sally, I love your basket. I, I love <laughs> the shape of it. I think it's, it's uh, I, I bought in Korea, when I went there, I bought a, a, like a low profile um, flower arranging bowl or dish. And, and that's what it reminds me of. But it's, I think it's really beautiful. And, and I love the combination of, of the, the blue plastic with with the green natural materials. I think it's really so, pleasing. Thanks, thanks, Gail. Something to know if you're not a, a basket person, you want to work with natural materials, is that the natural materials they have to be they have to be dried first. And it, so I guess it's kind of like take up for us loom weavers. Yeah. And you by drying it first, you incorporate the quote take up, and and then um, when you actually weave with them, you re wet them, and then you have the shrinkage that happens, like when the project is woven and then it dries again, there's, there's a change in the textile, so to speak. So that was kind of new information for me um, when I worked on this too. It, it so looks, it was a great learning, it was a great learning project. It looks beautiful and, and it's, it's very compatible with the aloe plant too. <laughs> yeah. 
And Sally, you must be an amazing spinner because I've been spinning for over 15 years. I could not spin plastic like that on a spindle. That's incredible. <laughs> I, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure if it was necessary just cutting it. I mean, maybe, um, you know, uh, I, I could have just twist, probably twisted it or whatever. Um, but I was just bound and determined to spin it all. And I did. And I'm like, Gail, when I'm watching TV, I want to keep busy. Um, but I just didn't realize how sore my elbow was on the right side, like for a couple of months after I finished the spinning. But Sally, weren't you spinning on the treadmill for a while? Or do I remember wrong? I don't think I ever took it on the, I don't think I took it on the treadmill. I would be okay. reading, I'd be reading, I'd be reading like Lambert, Color and Fiber <laughs> on the treadmill. <laughs> okay. But yeah, Thank no, not me. <laughs> Thank goodness, Sally. <laughs> that sounds dangerous. <laughs> okay, uh, Barbara, has Barbara joined us? She was sort of in transit. Okay, uh, and she hasn't joined us. Wait a minute, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, okay. Just trying to unmute. Um, and thank you, I've been, I enjoyed it. I have a friend with me and we're enjoying seeing all the various projects. Um, so it's, it is very interesting that the picture on the right comes out looking very blue because it is very black. Um, so I had an end of a warp. I was weaving a rug and I had an end of a warp uh, that must have been about 20, I think it was about 20 inches wide. And um, I, the challenge came along. And so I said, wonder what I can do. So I started looking through um, various, I have sewn for many, many years and have scraps of fabric from a variety of things. And I almost never throw anything away. Um, so I went looking through my um, stash and found um, the red was about an inch and a half uh, strip of fabric that I had cut off, I had shortened a dress. Um, and I saved the inch and a half, it was a wraparound dress, so it was quite long. Um, and so that's what the red um, at the top and the bottom is. The bluish in the center um, is a pair of boxer shorts it's actually purplish blue that had little fish on it. Um, my husband, my son um, sort of saves things. It's 100% cotton and he likes to save cotton things for rags. And so that, that happened to be sitting there. So I cut that into strips. Um, and the green and black um, were just in my um, rag rub bin. Um, so then the, the little, uh, the flower, uh, has actually been sitting on my sewing table in or near where I sew for I think 20 years because 20 years ago my son was married and um, I, I had three little granddaughters and I made them flower girl dresses and needed to learn how to make a fabric flower and so this was my sample and I just never threw it away so there it is um, and the buttons are a friend a good friend gave me um, a stash of his mother's buttons and that's what that is. And um, the lining, which uh, you can see under the buttons in the left picture, uh, the lining is a pair, piece of beautiful, beautiful uh, Italian silk brocade that I was left from the wedding vest that I made for my son 20 years ago. Uh, he wanted to be married in a vest, not a fancy jacket. And I had just enough left um, to make the lining with a pocket. So um, you can't see in the picture on the right, you can't see the lining, but the lining is um, underneath the red button there. Um, and so that's, and the um, cording, which makes a handle I found uh, the uh, clasp that uh, covers over the button, which you can't, you can't really see, um, uh, I twisted, I made by twisting um, three pieces of uh, silk cording together. And so there you have it. Um, and the, the inside the lining, it has a pocket. It's going to be quite a useful little party bag. So that's it. Barbara. 
on your fringe at the top, no. are they half hitch knots or double t hitch knots? Uh, the you mean the cording at the top? Yeah, <clears throat> that it, I it, it's braided, um, and it was commercial. I found wow. it in my um stash of stuff. I have no idea where I got it or what I got it for. Um, but it's it's twisted braided. Mm -hmm. So Barbara, what size is it? Pardon? How, uh, what, how big is the bag? How big is the bag? The bag is about 12 inches long by about 10 inches wide. So it's 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 um uh, it would hold it certainly will hold my cell phone and a wallet and house keys and yeah it's pretty big nice okay okay yes um i don't believe april is with us i think that she's working but she made a wall hanging and you can read all about it um but she did some knitting and she used some gold silk yarn and she printed cloth and leaves and stems and hair and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, whoops, sorry. Um, it's a pretty amazing American flag and a, uh, The whole point is that the, the country is broken and so the flag is sort of disintegrating at the bottom there into stripes. Um, and I'm not sure what these white things are, the flowers, but it's quite remarkable. And then we also have Anna Marie, or uh, I'm sorry, Anna May. Is she here today? I think she said that she couldn't make it either. Um, she does Sayora, Sayori weaving, and she used plastic bags, another person with the plastic bags, but these are all sort of monochromatic. And she made this uh, wall hanging that's, that's pretty transparent, which is kind of cool. You can see that colors uh, and the, the light coming through it. And uh, I guess most of them are single use plastic bags. So they're the ones that you find like in the produce section. So Carol? Yes. Um, this, this reminds me that like the cellophane looking um, plastic in this uh, reminds me of um, Annie Albers using cellophane. And Sally, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, because you're pretty knowledgeable about that. Well, I liked these pieces. <laughs> I, liked Anna, I liked Anna's piece uh, here. Um, I don't know. I've been weaving with cellophane, but it wasn't recycled. But I do know cellophane was a new product in the early 1900s. Annie Albers well with it. I think I, I think. I'd have to go look at my book, but I want to say like in the 20s was maybe the first time between the 20s and 40s. And um, it was originally designed, I think one of the purposes was to wrap meat so that it would, the meat would, you could see through the cellophane, but it would kind of keep the flies and stuff off the meat. Um, and then it was also used in Hollywood. Uh, I was able to, if you Google it, I was able to see some dresses that really kind of glittered like in the, in the, uh, I think it was like in the late 30s, 40s. I'd have to go look at my documentation, but there were just a few photographs that showed it being used in garments and it was very sparkly. Um, and the, I think it was, I think Annie Elbers wore that, wove that sample in the 20s. I'm not positive. And it might've been, or it could have been the 40s, somewhere in that time span. Well, I, um, Sally, I think it would have to be the 40s because didn't she come here in, in uh, like yes. before World War II to escape the Nazis? Thanks, Gail. Yeah, I've sure. been weaving linen now for the last like month and a half, and I did <laughs> the whole cellophane thing. <laughs> it's like two or three months ago. But um, yeah, it, it, I was gonna say I think it was in the '40s because of the style. And then I'm not sure the sample that I found was, and I can't remember if it was Harvard or Yale archives that I found. So I did fabric analysis to figure out how she wove it, 
and then reproduced it with cellophane. And I, I, might, I think I talked to the New York Guild about that and I finally was able to do a reproduction sample, but um, that was something I was kind of chewing on sometime over the past winter. But anyway, just, I think this piece is fabulous. I love the way that it is translucent and you see the shadows through it. Yes, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. And I love all the different colors of bags that yet it, it has a, the look of neutrals. Uh, let's see, okay, before we go to the last slide, I wanted to go back to Lynn, who, sorry, um, Lynn couldn't make it because her Wi-Fi is down where she is. Uh, so I'll just talk about what she did here. She made a bunch of different pillows using uh, leftover recycled saris and she cut them up. And she lives in Vancouver, so I guess she didn't have a lot of use for uh, sari skirts up there since it's pretty cold. So she cut them up into strips and she made these uh, pillowcases. And then she just took the different pillowcases and, and photograph them and put them together in this collage because she said the pillows weren't too interesting. And they were too difficult to see the, the actual details. So she used um, A2 cotton uh, for the warp and then she used the one inch, sorry, stri uh, strips. And then she did this kind of sort of plain weave maybe, I don't know what you would call it, a combination plane weave, I guess. Uh, and she, she has all of these different ones and, and they're just, just beautiful. So that was a good use of a bunch of skirts. Has anybody ever done that before? With sorry skirts or sorry fabric? I've gotten uh, yarn that's made out of sari skirts and I've used that, but it's like it falls apart if you look at it too hard. I, I've used it too quite a lot in, and I've made some table runners from it. And so, well, they're five years old and they're so far so good. Great. Okay, so did I get everyone in the, of the entries? I don't know what happened to mine, but that's okay. Oh no, did I forget you? Yeah, I don't, I don't see it anywhere, so don't worry about it. No, 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 let's go see. Let me just make sure, hold on, stop share. Oh, you're not there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one second, let's see. Yes. It was a mending project. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so let me go and share my screen. Okay. One second. You don't want to see who wins? Oh, I guess we could see who wins. Yeah, not me. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. I'm so sorry, Nancy. All right, so I've got three pictures here. Yeah, I I didn't read. Okay, sometimes I don't read directions. <laughs> That's a close up. I'm basically, this is a pair of jeans that I totally love because they're so light. They're great for summer, but because they're so light, they mm, they sort of started ripping. So I used to be a quilter, and I all this fabric. So I took a couple pieces of the fabric folded over the edges and use some of my thicker oh, sewing thread and just started stitching away. So it's all hand stitched. And the fabric has been in my stash for like 20 years. And I got lots more of it, don't worry. So um, next one. Okay, that's the other piece. That's the first piece that I started with. And that's a variegated yarn, uh, yarn, so you can see it in some spots and not so much in other spots. 
you can see it's purple and yellow or something like that. And I just had kind of fun, you know, you sit in front of the TV and you want something to do, so you do this. And the only problem I had was, you know, the legs of jeans are thin, skinny and it's hard to get that needle down, up and down. So I was doing it one stitch at a time. But I did notice that, okay, above and below these patches, it's starting to get too thin. So I'm gonna have to add more patches to these jeans. If you go to the next slide, that's the whole picture. Yeah, and that's my supervisor next to it. Too. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. That's it was fun. Yeah, it was gave me something to do and it was fun. Nancy? Yes. Did, did you stitch the the inner stitching um, on the fabric before you put the patch on the jeans? No, I, I put I took um, long need uh, long they, they call them ice picks. The uh, quilters call them ice picks because they're so, so pointy and they really get you. But I just, I just attached the uh, fabric to the jeans with uh, those pointy uh, pins and then I just started stitching. I did a blanket stitch around the edge and I did turn the edge under. You can see the blanket stitch there. And then I just started stitching away. I wore these jeans in high school. Oh, oh <laughs> I remember. Yeah, I just really like the jeans and okay, so I'm turning yeah. it into it you now that I'm so much older, but what can I say? I wonder if it would have worked to put a, a can like from soup or something else inside the leg to give you something more Ooh. solid to, to stitch from. That would have been great. So instead of my fingers being the okay. solid thing, okay. yeah. I also have a pair of um, pants that I cannot give up and they're falling apart. So this is a great idea to yeah. have my fabric stash. Yeah. I kind of like the second one. That's this one that's showing right now. Um, I like the way the stitching came out. But, and no, I didn't use a ruler or anything like that. I just didn't use my eyeballs. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. All right. Thank you very much. And, and I'm sorry that I, I missed your, your slide. But at least we got to see what you did. Yeah, I was a little bit late turning it in, but it's there. OK, great. Well, thank you very much, um, everyone. And uh, I wanted to let you know, remind you that our uh, Season starts on September 24th. We will be at School of Visual Arts. I have a room now and I will also be Zooming those, those classes or those uh, speakers. And the speaker this time is going to be on the flax to linen project that the Francis Irwin Guild in New Jersey did uh, where they actually grew flax and then harvested it and then spun it and then wove it and they ended up with fabric. So it's, it's a pretty remarkable effort that they did. So it'll be interesting to see and hear more about that. Uh, anyone have anything else that they want to share? I just um, want to give a great round of applause. Yes. For everyone. <laughs> Jeff, you wanted to say something, Jeff? Yeah. I was just gonna share one tiny little project. Sure. Um, Jeff's a new so, member. Addy, I, I started teaching myself weaving like two weeks ago. So here's my project. <laughs> uh, my wife is a, a, does printmaking and we have a bunch of canvases around the house. So I, uh, to make my first loom, I used an old <laughs> canvas uh, with uh, screws in the top and then an art marker in the bottom and then uh, masking tape to put it together and then wove my first uh, dog scarf. Oh. <laughs> That's great. Very nice. Thank you. Although I'll show you one thing. If, um, if um, people want to take Katie out on the wire. <laughs> so um, basically, if you do, if you, you can weave with wire and it's double weave, 
and you can open it up, right? This is just all wire and you can make a box. So, so what kind it, of loom do you use to do that? With? I, I did this on a table loom in a workshop. Uh -huh. <laughs> what, who taught that workshop, Sally? Uh, it was at Convergence like 20 years, no, I 10 years ago. Okay. Um, but there's I, I, basically it's anyone. Yeah, it was, like, yeah, that's how Anastasia, Anastasia Azure weaves her stuff. Yeah, no, this was way before her. I've yeah, taken. No, I know. That's why I, it's I, interesting. I think yeah. her name is McGee. It, her yes. last name is McGee. I yes. I took I took that I made a box just like that. I took that weaving class. It was amazing, and it was a long time ago. I, I was just laughing because I think I've taken every wire weaving class that has ever been offered, and I finally got to Anastasia, and she was great because she informs you about like the different properties of different kinds of metal, and if you bend them too much, they'll break. And she mm -hmm. was, you know, that was kind of. Um, for me, that was what led to me weaving with monofilament and all these other crazy things I've been weaving with the last right. couple of years. Um, but this was just interesting because y'all, a lot of you might know how to set up double weave anyway. It's just not that hard. And it's just how you bend, how you bend it. And then I just added a lid and I've got to add a bottom. But um, so, so Katie, you might want to hang on to that wire yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you everybody for your feedback. Secondly, how do you work with wire with it without it kinking up on you? Every time I try it, I get these unknotted knots. You have to keep it weighted all the time. Okay. Basically, you can't you can't let it go. It has to be kept on a weight. Or short segments. Yeah, or very short, yeah. So and also it depends on the wire. Which well, wire you're using too. It makes it makes a difference which wire you use and how it's spooled originally and a lot well, of different factors. If you have a short length, that makes sense to me. But if you're making a warp with it, you have a longer length. Yeah. So how do you you, you wait you wait it? So when 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 we wound the warp, um I think we it was a three yard warp, something like that. And we, we went ahead and used a warping board, but you don't want to uh, chain it or do anything like that. You just, you know, you just leave it. You don't, cause like you're right, every time you bend it, you're weakening the wire. So you definitely don't want kinks. And um, if you had, one of the things I thought was very interesting is she actually wound her warps using a warping reel. And when, when I saw the giant spools, my thought was if, if you're doing sectional or whatever, why don't you just go the spool directly onto the beam because you're not introducing any kinks at all. You're going from round to round, but she didn't work that way. I thought that was very interesting. And the other question I asked during the workshop is I said, what happens if a warp thread breaks? And she said, well, that never happened. That has never happened. <laughs> and it didn't to me, but, but I assume you'd probably have to kind of twist the if it did break you'd have to you know twist the wire with a new wire and weight it or whatever and then probably kind of figure out some way to sort of replace that like we would you know after you took the piece off the loom that you want to untwist or you want to correct that because that that twist would look so that I never got the answer to that question about what happened but it never did happen yeah if, um, you, if your wire is too thin it can happen uh you know if you the gauge is too is too thin it can happen so what do you do then, Donna? Do you just piece it in haven't, like that? I haven't or? been there yet, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Russian join, like you would use for silk or a very slippery thing would work. You basically interlock, hook the two against each other um, and you oh. taper it down the way you would with a multiply. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I would think that if it breaks, then you're losing the properties of wire to begin with. If it's that thin that it would break. Yeah. Good so. point. Sounds like something that needs to be explored, right? Yeah. <laughs> Go for it, Sally. <laughs> and a few people have mentioned in the chat that you could solder the wire, although yeah. I don't know if I'd want to solder the wire while it's on yeah. there, but yeah no <laughs> oh so wouldn't like that <laughs> yeah it would be very hard to isolate like one wire doing that for sure yeah i will say though that i feel as though i've spent more time at a 
at a hardware store for this hobby than any of my other hobbies. And that would just push me a little bit farther into the <laughs> hardware store. Oh, definitely. I love oh. hardware stores. Yeah. All right. Um, one last thing that Gail reminded me of is uh, the speaker in September, even though we're having an in-person meeting, the, speaking, in, the speaker is going to be remote. Um, so, you know, if, ah. you're, if, you're depend, if you're deciding whether you're going to come or not, uh, you might keep that in mind. However, I will tell you that we have some door prizes mm -hmm. and we have uh, some freebies and we're going to have um, some new books from the library. So, you know, it would be nice if people could come. We'll try and socially distance. The room is supposed to fit 50 people. So we should be able to, uh, you know, social distance as, as we need to. So but I'm gonna, have, I have a book I can finally return. <laughs> yes, please. And please bring your books, your library books to return. Mm -hmm. uh, but there'll be a lot more information in the newsletter that's gonna come out in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so great. thank you every, everyone for uh, attending. And I hope you guys all enjoyed the sustainability projects. It was okay. awesome. Very yeah. fun. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Can I ask a quick question about in-person meetings and specifically with the library as a new member? Um, 